the discussion around the advent of HIV and its devastating impact didn't escape this conundrum of race. Um, there was this whole notion amongst white people that blacks in general either are or were promiscuous, which fed into the narrative that this was the fact that HIV was being seen as a black disease was actually a white attack on the black persona. I hope that as I go on, you'll realize why I'm starting where I'm starting. So when someone like President Thabo Mbeki, for example, was coming up with all that resistance against HIV causing AIDS, you have to understand it in the context of him trying, seeing this as part of the general white attack on black people, this whole notion that black men can't keep it in the zip. No. So, for example, if you look at America, the initial discourse was that HIV was uh, a non-heterosexual uh, sexual activity induced uh, uh, disease. In South Africa, the discourse was angled on race. Uh, <clears throat> and as such, there was what I call the two dimensions of the debate around HIV and AIDS. One was the politics of it, and the other was the science of it, uh, where you're dealing with treatment and its effects. So in that whole politicized, race-obsessed debate, enter the media uh, <clears throat> and how HIV, people who were living with HIV uh, uh, and AIDS were seen as people who were sufferers. The face of this HIV was in the main black. Photographers and uh, television crews would just go to black hospitals, and we still have black hospitals, and find people queuing for whatever uh, health assistance that they need. But they would just snap away and come back with these pictures of these women sitting there with their babies. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and there would be the following day's illustration or tonight's illustration in the news about HIV and AIDS. This would be people whose permission to be photographed wouldn't even have been uh, requested. Whether they uh, are living with HIV and AIDS or not, it wasn't an, an issue. They were black, they were sitting in a hospital, so what else could they be there for? <clears throat> so when a, a white judge called Judge Edwin Cameron came out and said, he was living with HIV and AIDS. There was like a palpable uh, relief amongst many people. So in trying to move the debate around this issue, Judge Cameron became the new face of HIV. In the papers that I was editing, for example, I banned the use of any black person as an illustration of a story around AIDS, unless that story is talking about that particular person. If you were just talking generally, go and take a picture of Judge Cameroon and put it there. He became my everyday symbolism of uh, somebody living with uh, HIV and AIDS. So any photographer who worked for me, for example, knew that they can no longer just go to a hospital and come back with pictures and say this can be used as illustration of AIDS. Uh, um, they would have to show me even the permission from that person who says, yeah, indeed, I grant permission for, for the picture to be taken. So <clears throat> in the middle of all of that, there was a lot of activism around the issue of HIV and AIDS. NGOs were, were formed. Some were very prominent, like the Treatment Action uh, Campaign. Uh, <clears throat> and 
they brought with them a new language around talking about the issue of HIV and AIDS. So instead of AIDS sufferers, people were now people who were living with the virus. And that language permeated the coverage of, of, of the media. Prominent people like uh, Nelson Mandela came out embracing people who were living with HIV and AIDS, which uh, uh, meant that, okay, so maybe if Mandela really can, it, it, it means yeah, it doesn't really matter. Maybe you can't get it by just hugging somebody. Uh, <clears throat> so, a few years ago, uh, Dr. Mbajiogo did a doctoral uh, a thesis which looked at uh, South African newspapers' coverage of HIV and AIDS pandemic and audience attitudes in a particular province called Limpopo. And in that uh, uh, thesis, he got his doctoral, uh, uh, his PhD for, for it. Uh, <clears throat> he found that the media in South Africa had actually uh, communicated high quality HIV and AIDS news stories to the public. So. Uh, he was looking even at the language and the analysis and what sort of stories were being done. And I, I hope uh, the organizers here will uh, hand out this thing so that we don't have to go through the actual findings one by one. But in essence, he found that the South African media had done well uh, in, in its coverage of uh, HIV and AIDS. But in a sense, the issue around HIV and AIDS was probably easy to do because it was this big thing that was happening. It was a big international story. And if you looked at people, uh, you could see that they were having this problem sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> there was even language about people were slimming when uh, they were disappearing slowly. But the issue that we are confronted with here, which is uh, what my brief was, what is it that we can learn from what South Africa did, the South African media did around HIV and AIDS coverage in relation to the debate around infertility? Infertility is, is private and personal. And the prejudice that uh, uh, um, we're trying to deal with uh, is directed mainly towards women. But even though it is private and personal, its manifestation is public in the absence of the baby. This is the big thing uh, uh, when you're a woman back there, say, where is the baby? And in some areas, you find the granny in waiting, sort of like the mother to the husband, who would have said whatever she feels needed to be said, and the baby was still not coming. She would just take maybe even a, a piece of wood and put it on her back and walk around carrying that. And if anybody asked, she would say, what can I do? I don't have a grandchild. And you can imagine what that does to the woman from whom this baby is being expected. <clears throat> I come from a little village called Chabarubedzi. It's in the Limpopo province. There's a <clears throat> an old lady there who's probably now about 75 years old. So about three weeks back, I was home and somebody else was talking about her. Her name is Boma Quarel. Now, this other person says, which Boma Quarel are you talking about? Are you talking about Boma Quarel who doesn't have a child? She's about 75 years old, but the only defining thing in so far as this other woman is concerned is the fact that Boma Quarel doesn't have a child. 
this is about three weeks ago, and it just hit me that this is so bad. I remember a few years back, uh, a, a cousin of mine uh, and his wife had, had been having problems. They didn't have a child. So eventually they went and adopted. Um, so some other girl was uh, being funny, and this woman was scolding her. And this one says to her, I don't talk to a woman who can give birth. This is a small child who's saying this to this woman. And this woman just walked away, went home. This is a few years back. It stayed with me because I could see the pain that is there. So even from where I live as a man, I have a bit of understanding of how difficult uh, a life can be. So the media's role in this instance would be limited to discussions around the causes of uh, infertility, infertility uh, <clears throat> and societal attitudes. But as I, I was saying last night, the faces are far in between that you need to tell the story. Uh, <clears throat> because people hardly want to talk about how they are grappling with issues. And that is why what Mulatelo has done, which is the documentary that I'm told will be shown when I finish speaking here uh, and we finish with this afternoon's uh, session, there'll be the screening of her uh, documentary where she documents her entire struggle to get this baby that she didn't get. But you need those faces and those voices that speak from inside. Not Matata, who has four children and a wife and whatever, we are okay and I'm sympathetic. That, 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 that helps maybe in getting resources to, to get the campaign going. But in order to actually reach people, you need people who speak from what Jimmy Cliff would have uh, uh, said in his song, who feels it, knows it. Last night I spoke about the issue of the uh, dwindling media economies uh, uh, and the fact that uh, in many newsrooms specializations are dying. Uh, it's what we call back home one man buto. So one person must go out and do virtually everything and as such <coughs> um, the in-depth coverage that would be needed if we are to succeed with a program like the one that we are trying to do here, uh, it's going to be difficult. Already in South Africa, many of the in-depth stuff that is being done, whether it's around health with uh, a, a, an institution like the Mail and Guardian where they have a unit called Bekisisa, uh, it's all funded by donors. Uh, Amabungane, which is an investigative unit that has been responsible for all the political coverage that brought Zuma down. Uh, <clears throat> all of that work, it's funded by donors. The, the publications themselves can no longer afford uh, long-term investigations that take two months, three months, sometimes six months. They, 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 they don't have the money. So this is, I suppose, where... <clears throat> Uh, um, <clears throat> Mac has to, 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 be, to be looking in that direction if uh, they really want to have this thing making the kind of impact that uh, is, is, is needed. Um, the legacy media of print and television uh, <clears throat> is still important, but in the main, I think concentration has to be on radio to reach people who can't go online. Uh, 
and then the online versions that are there that, that create networks that allow people to come out and speak uh, without even uh, identifying themselves. Those are the areas where investments, I think, would need to go. I also think that sex education at school and the kind of biology lessons that go beyond the bees and the flowers, uh, but which emphasize the complex process of conceiving and the survival of a fetus in the womb for nine months and then safe delivery. I think it's important that that education happens at school from a very young age. Uh, and it's got to be education that shows any, that any minor misalignment in that plumbing system of either partner can result in a serious malfunction. And that when that happens, if science can't fix it, it shouldn't be a disaster either. Because indeed, uh, to be a man is not just only being a father. You can be a man without being a father. You can be a woman without being a mother. Thank you very much.